So yeah, so I'm gonna provide a, a primer into the basics of drug discovery, it's focused on psychiatric disease, to kind of give everybody a sense for how we do it, but also just give you a clue as to why it's so hard and why it's so expensive and it takes so long. And some of the things that we're doing in the therapeutics group to try to tackle that. So this is actually a variation of a, of a lecture I gave to uh, at Lee Rubin's senior seminar course. So I kind of assume that everybody here is as smart and knowledgeable as a Harvard senior in the neuroscience program. So. And we're probably not intoxicated. <laughs> Most likely, yes. Okay, so this is the, uh, the outline. So I'm gonna give a, an overview of the whole process of drug discovery in 15 minutes. So, and how new, new drugs are developed. And then specifically some of the challenges that arise with psychiatric disease uh, drug discovery in particular. And then I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail about a project that we've uh, done in our group in collaboration with Kevin Egan's group to use stem cell derived neurons to try to address some of these issues. So it's sort of illustrative of some of the ways that we think we can use some of the new technologies to address some of the issues uh, that I mentioned earlier. All right, so first, introduction to drug discovery. So, uh, so this is sort of the basic timeline for drug discovery process. So this is actually a bit of a miss, uh, it's not technically accurate because Usually you start these projects with hundreds of thousands of compounds. In some big pharma, you can actually start with millions of compounds. And over the course of 10 to 15 years, you actually end up with an FDA approved drug through going through these stages of refining the compounds, making them more drug-like, make sure they're safe, and eventually testing them in the clinic and then getting to the FDA. And this whole process is, a, is really surprising, but there's a study that came out in 2014 uh, or shows that on average, these actually cost about two and a half billion dollars to go from idea to drug. So it's 1.4 billion out of pocket, and then whatever you lose it from investment money by not investing that, by putting it into this, another 1.2 billion dollars. So, uh, but it's also important to note though that this is actually backloaded. So most of this cost is in the clinical trials and the backstage. So we don't start you know, burning 1.4 divided by five per year. That's not what our budget is in our therapeutics group. Um, but it just shows how this is a really difficult, time-intensive and uh, expensive project, and so companies are highly risk-averse to not take on projects that aren't really well-validated or likely to be successful. So how do we uh, start a project? Well, this is, I mean, basic question is starting with a disease. So uh, this is easy for us because our mandate is psychiatric disease with a focus on schizophrenia and bipolar disease. But if you're a company, that's a different story. It's uh, because there's a lot of economic factors that come into play. So we are lucky that we don't have the um, profit motive to drive our decision making. We can really focus on tackling what is a really difficult project but should be, uh, but is really necessary in terms of uh, uh, mental health issues. So, uh, so we're focused on that, obviously. And now uh, the next question is a disease mechanism. So we need to understand how these, uh, what are the basic underlying causes of these disorders? So here I'm highlighting uh, synaptic pruning or uh, microglial activity in general. And so this kind of disease mechanism can play a role in multiple different types of diseases, such as neuroinflammation, maybe involved in Alzheimer's disease or Huntington's disease. And as we know, synaptic pruning is something that's been implicated in schizophrenia. So this is our disease mechanism, and this is what we want to try to rescue or try to restore. So the next thing is, is identifying a drug target. So a target is some kind of macromolecule. Typically it's a protein, but it could be something else. Uh, and that's, the, that's what a drug will interact with uh, to rescue that disease mechanism. So it's something, it's a protein typically that you can, the drug will target, restore the function of the pathways uh, that underlie this disease mechanism. And these types of targets are identified through all sorts of different ways, uh, by basic biology research and screening, uh, proteomics, RNA-seq, all those sorts of things that are happen here at the Broad. Uh, but critically, one of the things we talk about routinely is, is a target druggable, right? So can you, can you target it with a small molecule? And this is something we repeatedly ask ourselves, is this pathway or is this target itself something that's druggable? And that, if it's druggable, that means it has a binding pocket 
which is about the size of a small molecule, a small molecule being a drug. And what that means is if it can get that, if you can get that drug to bind into that pocket, it can then disrupt the function of this, of this uh, protein either by enhancing it or inhibiting it. And then that can go on to then rescue your, your disease mechanism. So um, most proteins are not druggable because they don't have these kind of small molecules or uh, binding pockets for small molecules that you can get in and then target. So there are what are the typical druggable target classes. And so most of them are enzymes, GPCRs, channels, transporters, and things that, again, the function can be modulated in this way. So there are new efforts, uh, some of which are coming out of the road, to target the non-druggable genome using like targeted degradation technologies and that kind of thing. And those are really promising for opening up whole new avenues of, of drug targets. And they're just starting to hit the mainstream. But I'm not going to focus on that kind of technology here. OK, so once you have a drug target, so you have a, you have a target where you, where you think you can hit with a small molecule and you think it may play a role in your disease mechanism, then you have to then confirm that, right? So you have to do the basic biology. And this is what we call validating the target. So we have to show that by modulating this target in the way that you think uh, your hypothesis is pushing the, uh, your, your thinking, um, that it then rescues that disease mechanism. So you can, if you're trying to inhibit something, you knock it out with RNAi or CRISPR, and then it rescues your disease mechanism. Maybe it makes uh, hyperactivated microglia less hyper, hyperactivated. That's a one step towards uh, validation. You actually validate the biology of the target. But there's a whole other host of things to think about, and this is where it starts to get complicated. It's not just biology, but it starts to think about uh, more of the systemic issues or in terms of um, what happens if you put a drug in the whole body. Right? So one of the big issues here is, is on-target side effects. So you could rescue uh, some sort of process in the brain, which is dysfunctional, but if that same target, the same mechanism is active somewhere else, it will cause more harm than good, potentially. And so a great example of this are opiates. So opiates are a fantastic uh, pain medication. They completely wipe out pain in a lot of situations. But they cause severe on-target on side effects, which then have severe societal issues. And one big issue with that is the addictive properties of, of opiates. And that's because it hits uh, opiates, morphine, heroin, its derivatives hit uh, the, the pain, or pain neurons in the spinal cord, but also hits whole hosts of neurons in the brain, which then causes addictive issues. It also causes things like gastrointestinal issues, uh, all through on-target mechanisms. And there are ways that people are trying to get around that kind of stuff. For example, people are trying to make opiates that can, f that can target GI problems, uh, but not have any of these other perfor or central issues, and through making it so they don't get through the, the colon, for example. So they just act on the target locally and then don't uh, distribute to the rest of the, rest of the body. So if a target has potential for severe on-target side effects, you just don't pursue it, or you find some clever way like, uh, like that to get around it. Another thing we think about is can we actually develop a screen? So you have to be able to understand whether, whether you can actually find small molecules that modulate its function. So if you can't modulate its function, or you can't measure modulation of its function, then you can't develop things that can actually modulate it. So you have to be able to develop an assay. So, so one other th phrase we often use is, is it ass assayable or assayable? Um, so these are the kinds of things we think about in terms of validating the target. Uh, there are other things as well, but let's, let's keep it simple. So, so now you have a validated, uh, identified and validated target, which you know targets your disease mechanism. You don't think it's, there's going to be on target side effects. Um, so next step is to develop a high throughput screening assay. So here, it's what you want is a, is a scalable assay that you can measure in things like uh, 96 or 384 well plates like this, where you can measure the impact of small molecule compounds on the function of your, of your uh, target using the assay that we identified before because it's actually an assayable target. And so here, you, uh, the idea is it's scalable, so you should be able to screen through libraries of compounds or rate out. Um, in our case, it's around 100,000 compounds or so. And again, in big pharma, you might have to scale it up to things like millions of compounds. Uh, so in developing assays, there's a whole bunch of things that you need to think about uh, and balancing all the different parts of, of this process. So it's very pragmatic. So um, you do need a high quality assay. And there's a, some of the things we think about are um, 
got to have good signal to noise. Z prime is this thing you might hear. It's a factor or it's a quantitative measure of the quality of an assay. Z prime essentially it gives you a, a sort of an estimation of the number of false positives and false negatives you have in a, in a screen. So it's, a, it's due to the, you know, it's based on the assay window and the standard deviation. So if you have a big assay window and low standard deviation in your controls, then you have a good Z prime, you have a good assay, you're gonna have few false positives and false negatives. And that's a big deal if you screen a library of three million compounds if you, you don't wanna follow up on things which are false positives. Uh, but also, for the pragmatics of it, then you have to balance the time. It's got to be done fast to screen through a lot of compounds. It can't take forever. And it also has to be relatively inexpensive. So, so finding a sweet spot between these three is where we want to be in terms of uh, developing high throughput screening assays. Okay, so you have your assay. Uh, you have your target, you have your assay. Now you want to do uh, chemical or high throughput screening of libraries. So um, this is a very small library, um, but this kind of idea of there's a whole bunch of different pharmacophores, different types of uh, structures. Uh, and again, our library is about 100,000 of these, and they should be diverse. There shouldn't be a lot of overlap, at least in a small library. So you want to target as many different types of mechanisms as you can get. Uh, and these are arrayed out in, into plates using robotics and liquid handling systems, and this is the kind of uh, system that lives here at CDOT. Uh, so they have all this, these liquid handling and, and uh, robotic capacities, capacity for doing uh, um, compound plating for doing screening. And then you use the robotics to, dis to dispense into each wells, and then you, do, you run your assay, and you look at the impact of your compound on the assay readout, see how it impacts your, uh, the function of your, of your target. And so then after that, there's a whole host of informatics and stuff that you really have to keep track of, uh, you know, what's in what well, which compound is in what well, um, whether you have replicates. So that informatics layer is a huge component of this as well. All right, so now you have a hit. So you have your assay based upon your target. Now you have a compound, say one of these compounds here, um, makes your readout go up so it fluoresces green and that's your hit and you want to pursue that one and take that one into drug discovery because it looks good for a number of reasons. Um, and so how do you do that? So, so this is a sort of rendering of a 3D crystal structure of a, of a target with a small molecule bound into it. So maybe it fits in this pocket here. And so the first step is to, and this is where uh, the chemists start to do their magic, but it's to identify the pharmacophore, which is sort of the basic uh, core of the molecule that, that defines its activity. And so when they sit inside this pocket, so the reason why it, it, it interacts with this is because it picks up all these um, interactions with these amino acids around the pocket. So that's what stabilizes its, its binding into that pocket and is what sort of determines its function. So, so one thing you want to do is identify, well, maybe it's this part of the, here, which is because of specific interactions, which is what really defines its, its activity uh, in this, in terms of modulating the target function. So then, uh, it, you need to spend a lot of time and effort making the compounds better, because these screening hits they identify here are not drugs. They're far from drug-like, and you need to turn those into drugs. Uh, by improving its, its interaction, making it higher affinity, and then, and I'll talk about a couple slides, improving its drug-like properties. <coughs> so, um, yeah, so at this point, you have your target, uh, you have your hit, and you want to turn into, make it more drug-like, because, um, yeah, again, so things that are coming right out of the library do not have the properties you need um, for it to be a safe and effective drug. And so uh, what chemists then do is a ton of uh, design and synthesis of compounds by modifying different aspects of the structure. And then we have to determine empirically how it then impacts its, its function or its activity in your primary assay and then um, some of the other properties that I'll be talk about in a couple of slides. And so then what you end up with is medicinal chemists then can develop hundreds or thousands of compounds based on original pharmacophore. Maybe this is your base pharmacophore and then you start to modify around that, try to find ways to improve its potency against your initial target and also some of these other properties. And this, looking at that relationship between, or identifying that relationship between structure and function uh, in your assay and other assays is 
um, what we call structure activity relationship or SAR. So a big aspect of drug discovery is determining this, this SAR, and this is actually a phrase we use uh, uh, quite routinely. So then as we're improving the compounds, we're making them more drug-like, and we'll uh, get to that in a second, but also doing things like improving the potency and selectivity. Uh, we have to then test them to make sure they're functional, or to show that they're functional against those original uh, disease mechanisms that we identified in the first place, right? So we have to determine their activity in, in disease-relevant cell types, like neuronal cultures in our case, um, things like disease-relevant brain circuitry, and this is the TRN, so our calcium channel project, uh, drug discovery project, targets the TRN. So we have assays, that, ex vivo assays done in slices to look to see how our compounds impact uh, various behaviors of uh, neurons in the circuit. And then you need in vivo assays. So when you have an in vivo assay, you show that the compound is getting into the brain, engaging the brain circuitry uh, that you want to be targeting in terms of your disease mechanism. And it shows that it's, it's effective against that target in that context. Um, and this is sort of the first step to showing that you could have a drug because you have a compound that, that could access the brain of a patient potentially or a compound that could uh, to potentially restore some of these disease mechanisms. Um, so, so part of this process is going through it, or, you know, more difficult and more stringent assays as the compound progress. So some of the other things we have to look at, and this is that drug-like uh, thing I was mentioning before, we have to make them more drug-like. And that is by, uh, by improving selectivity, which is key towards reducing what's called off-target side effects, which is different from on-target side effects. So when you get a drug that, or a compound that comes directly from the screen, it's not optimized for selectivity, and it's probably gonna hit a whole bunch of different targets. So a big part of the process then is gaining this selectivity. And one of the examples here uh, for off-target side effects is statins, which have obviously been developed for cardiovascular uh, issues, but almost all the statins have a relatively common side effect, which is a, a muscle phenotype. It turns out recently people identified that the statins bind to this uh, complex three protein in mitochondria, which might underlie its, its issues. So one of the things we want to avoid is, is targeted or um, hitting these off-target uh, proteins and uh, to reduce side effects in that way. But um, this is actually very different from the target for, of statins. So one of the other things you have to do is is screen against closely related targets. And so this is a figure from one of our sodium, our project uh, slide decks from our sodium channel project. And it's, we're targeting, for autism, we're targeting this protein NAV1.2, but it's a family, member of a much bigger family of, of uh, proteins, all of which are closely related. And so the idea is if we hit one of these other channels, like SCN5A will cause major problems and probably death. Uh, if we, uh, you know, if we have a channel or a compound that's not selective 1.2 over 1.5. So, so here we have a whole host of other assays we need to take into account where we have to now not just look at the activity against the primary target 1.2, but we have to then look to see a, a, at the compound's activity against these other channels. And we build in selectivity. So we, we might find a slight increase in 1.2 or improvement of 1.2 over 1.5 activity. Um, and then we, that's a little handle towards uh, making, getting selectivity. So then we start to improve that and try to get that difference to be bigger and bigger as we continue to optimize the compounds. So in this way we can ideally end up with quite selective compounds against uh, our target. Uh, but then there's this whole other uh, aspect towards uh, drug-like properties, and this is what, um, it's called ADME and toxicity. Um, so this is, this is a whole um, topic unto itself that people can take, you know, semester-long courses on. It's all on one slide here. But ADME is, uh, stands for absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. It just sort of describes what happens to a drug when it enters the body. And so um, we have to optimize each one of these characteristics in order to make it drug-like. Um, and in the, the issue is when you start to try to alter things on your compound, like you try to get selectivity by doing something to your compound, it might have a negative impact on one of these. So, so what medicinal chemistry, the magic of medicinal chemistry then is to try to improve all of these different factors 
in parallel. And so, and then you get a selective, potent compound that have um, good features or good admin qualities. And so that's how you end up with a drug. And that's why it takes so long to do this kind of stuff is because each one of these minute, minute changes you might make to the compound actually could impact these things quite substantially. And so you have to balance all of these different factors at the same time. So that's how you end up, you know, it takes years to go from a screening hit and hundreds and maybe thousands of compounds to go from screening hit to something which you think is, you know, approaching the state where you can think about going into humans. Uh, some other things that come up repeatedly are pharmacokinetics. So this is a, the concept of what um, the body does to the drug. So when you, you know, dose an animal or a human takes a drug, it's where, where does it go? Does it go to the brain? Does it, um, does it go to different organs that you're interested in targeting? So we routinely, uh, this is a big part of our process, to do PK on rodents. And this is to make sure, the big thing we're looking for is to make sure that it gets into the brain and then how long it stays there. Um, there's other aspects we look at too, but those are sort of the key things. And so um, that's why we often say, you know, people talk about, um, they do pharmacology experiments on rodents, and you say, well, did you do the PK on it? Do you actually know that it's getting into the brain? And a lot of times people actually haven't done this kind of thing. So if anybody ever wants to do pharmacology, then come talk to us. We can help you with the PK studies. And pharmacodynamics is the opposite of what's the body does to the drug, how does it get, get rid of it, what does it do to it? And one of the aspects of that is metabolism. And this is, I find this pretty interesting because um, the body kind of, it sees a drug as, as a poison, right? So it tries to get rid of it because it's a foreign molecule that it doesn't know what to do with. And so the way that the body gets rid of things is through the kidneys typically. Um, and kidneys filter out polar substances. And so there are a whole host of enzymes in all cells, but mostly in the liver that take these compounds these nonpolar compounds, and then metabolize them and turn them into polar metabolites, so smaller fragments of the same compounds with polar groups on them. And then they get filtered out of the kidneys. Um, so that's uh, in a big part of what we have to do in drug discovery is manage that metabolism. Because you, if you put something into the body and it metabolizes it right away, it's gone, it has a really short half-life, it doesn't do anything. Um, but if it's, so you want things to stick around. But if it sticks around too long, it could be a problem because if it's having some sort of off-target side effect and, it, and you have a three-day half-life, it's not something you wanna, you wanna have. But also you have to think about dosing because if you wanna have somebody remember to take a pill before they go to bed every night and that's what their routine is, it has to have the right half-life to make that happen. So if the half-life isn't right, you end up accumulating compounds or you're supposed to take it every three days so people forget. So this is the kind of thing which is important for managing uh, drug development. And um, yeah, and again, it's another feature that needs to be balanced. You make better, or compounds that have better metabolism profile, it might lose selectivity or something, and then you gotta start working on that again. And then there's issues that we look at like toxicity, right? So we can put compounds in cells to see if it's potentially carcinogenic. So those are the kinds of assets you can do in cells, you can do them relatively cheaply and quickly, and you get information quickly. So if you see carcinogenic potential, um, that's a concern for your whole compound series. All right, so when you put all this together, you end up with something like this. This is a screening tree um, from our calcium channel project. So essentially what it is, it's just a whole host of assays that are all sort of interactive or interfacing and talk to one another. Um, and so you end up going through, um, again, all these different assays. You start with your maybe your screening hits, and then you try to increase your potency and some initial selectivity. You, you start doing an ADME and things like cells, uh, and you start getting that information right away. And then you, as these compounds improve, you end up going through your secondary assays like neuronal assays or slice assays. And the whole time you're also selecting, looking at other broader selectivity. And eventually you do your PK, right? And then you go in vivo, right? So you start to get your the, the st start to see whether your compound getting into the brain engages the disease mechanism ways that, uh, mechanisms in the way that you want to. And this whole process is iterative. So this is where medicinal chemists come in and say, okay, uh, it's, it's, you know, we don't have good PK, so we need to change something in the compound, and it goes back in. And then you gotta see if it's still potent. Well, then, okay, it's still potent, does well here, oh, but it doesn't do well in vivo acid. So there's this iterative process of rescreening and screening.
that takes um, a long time to, to end up with a, in our case, our, what our typical goal is, which is a compound that shows in vivo proof of concept in some sort of animal model. So this is a kind of timeline for the work that we do here at the Stanley Center Therapeutics at the pharma would be very different, but um, so we have all of these activities happening in parallel. So that's why we have a big team of people um, working both in our group and through collaborations and also a whole host of CROs that do a lot of this work. Uh, and also working with folks like at CDOT, um, they all are necessary to drive this forward. And these pro projects, you know, we started this project um, years ago and hopefully this is an extremely aggressive timeline, but within four years, maybe we can have in vivo proof of concept. Um, so these projects are clearly time intensive and it requires big teams working closer together, together to get it done. All right, so, so with this, you have your in vivo proof of concept. You have your, your, you're excited because you can target your disease mechanism in the brain and you think it might turn into a drug. So this is your preclinical candidate. So it has all the properties you want. Good, good ADME, good PK. And you start to think about maybe how do you get this into the clinic at some point. And that's, to do that, you gotta do this. Um, which I'm not gonna go through in any detail. Uh, but I don't know much about this. This is actually a lot of stuff that's beyond what I do. But the key aspect to look at here are talks. A key thing is talks, right? So, so remember what I um, said before, if you're worried about off-target side effects, you can only screen so many things. But you don't really know until you put it into animals whether it's going to be toxic or not, right? So. So there's preliminary tox and then, and then there's uh, preclinical tox. And these are really long studies where you inject your compound or dose the animals with compounds uh, and look over a long period of time and then do a lot of pathology to see what happens to the liver, what happens to the kidney. And then it's all this stuff has to be done before it can get into humans. Um, and so then there's a lot, of, a lot of discussions with the FDA at this point as well. So the FDA is involved in, in a lot of this, uh, these discussions. And then it goes into the clinic. I'm sure most people are aware of the clinic. Um, so there's three phases. Phase one is more mostly around toxicity and dosing. Phase two, you start to get some impact, uh, some measure of efficacy as well. And phase three is the big study where you really need to get efficacy and you have to do better. Um, or you have to have some differentiation over the standard in the field. So if you have an antipsychotic, it has to be better than whatever that haloperidol or whatever the, the standard is in the field. So that's sort of the crash course of drug discovery. Um, if there's any questions. Did you talk about the blood brain barrier earlier? Oh, no. Anything? No, I didn't actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, Back when you did distribution. Just, yeah. Just because just it makes your life even harder than you described. Yeah, that's a good point that I just didn't totally space on. Um, yeah, so the big issue, one of the big issues with the brain, with the PK and distribution, as Steve just mentioned, is. Um, blood brain barrier. So getting compounds into the brain is, is hard. Um, and so they have to have very particular properties that require it to get into the brain, but then those properties can't be so stringent that it doesn't then impact your ability to target your target of interest, right? So, uh, so that one of the, that's one of the things that makes it really challenging is, um, and it makes it a challenge for the chemist to build compounds that can that can do that, both get into the brain and do what it needs to do once it's there. And at this point, there's no predictive algorithms for that. It's really just, um, it's uh, empirical. Um, and it's not just getting through, but it's also pumps that pump it back out, right? So it has to be able to traverse, but then not get pumped back out because the brain tries to get rid of things that, poisons that get into it. So there's actually design to pump things like small molecules back out of the brain. So you have to avoid those pumps as well. Um, so, it's challenging. So, how do you measure, uh, you know, you give an animal a drug, how do you determine that it's getting to where it's supposed to, how do you determine when you're testing PK that the drug is getting where it's supposed to go? Yeah, so in terms of how, how PK actually done. Um, well, honestly, that's something I could ask the chemist. To do. My understanding is, uh, you, you know, you dose your animal, however you're going to dose, PO in the, or, and then you, you take the brain out and then you grind, essentially grind it up and then you do mass spec to look for the presence of the compound in, in, the, in the actual tissue itself. Um, 
chemists can correct me if I'm wrong on anything. Um, but that's, I think that's how it's done. Molly. So yeah, I was wondering that how do you select the, or choose the, uh, these high throughput assays? And, and well, I guess the, maybe you will talk about it for psychiatric diseases, but the relationship between the disease and then what you see in a, whatever system you use to uh, select the potential drug molecules. Do you see where I'm getting at? So essentially yeah. kind of how do you know that that assay is actually measuring a relevant thing that or whatever you want to, the drug molecule yeah. to do that it's actually relevant for the, dise for the disease? Yeah, it's a good question. So, I mean, it, it depends entirely on your assay format. So if you're interested in, a, in an enzyme, you can purify the enzyme. It's the only thing in your tube. So you know that it's impacting your enzyme. But then that's, that's so reduced, maybe that's not of interest. You want to look at in a more cellular context, so then you back up and that's the, the, you know, the assay I'll talk about at the end in terms of um, psychiatric disease is the cell base, it's a neuronal based assay. Uh, but then the complication there is you might be able to hit your mechanism, but then you might not know what the target is. It's more of a phenotypic type screen. And then that makes it hard to know whether you're on target and then, if, or what target you're hitting, so then you don't know how to do selectivity. So then, then you have to figure out what your target is before you can start to think about the toxicity issues. Or you don't know if you could do on target, if they're gonna be on target tox, if you don't know what the actual target is. So that, that's one of those, another balance between reduced preparations and, and more complex preparations in terms of finding that pragmatic balance of where you wanna be. Does that address the question? It wasn't. Yeah, I guess so. I, I was just wondering if they, if you have kind of generalized or something like that, but how do you know that it's uh, relevant, like say that I don't know how you choose exactly the target genes, but if you would have a GWAS hit somewhere that, and then you figure out the maybe relevant gene and you have a regulatory variant there, how do you decide that what is the kind of function behind that whole thing? That say if it's a regulatory variant in front of a iron channel gene, yeah. then you, like how do you go from that variant to actually an iron channel function that then oh, would yeah. lead to schizophrenia or somehow uh, affect well, the yeah. symptoms of schizophrenia. Well, that's, that's a whole other variant of function sort of question, right? <laughs> Which I guess we assume to some level that other people are, are helping do that. <laughs> and that, um, you know, the biology is kind of worked out at that point in terms of the impact of a variant on biochemistry of the cell. And, um, you know, I, this is sort of based on that assumption that we're already kind of past that. We know that it's a decent target. But at the same point, at the same time though, doing this kind of work can actually lead to probe molecules which can then be useful for interrogating that, that biology, right? So if, you, if the genetics points to a target, you can generate a molecule which might make it more or less active, and then you can then use that to probe the biology to see if that target is actually involved in your disease mechanism. So there's value to doing it, even if you don't know that yet, and it could then become the base of a therapeutic. So we, we just, you know, all, so much of this is empirical. Yeah, Tyler. I'm just curious about the scale of the PKPD experiments and whether they're always done in mouse, or and is it prohibitive to do that in a non-human primate model? And would you want to? I know at some point <clears throat> you'll test the molecule in a macaque or other species for toxicity, most likely. But where does it enter into the thought process? Yeah, I mean, for us, I mean, I think what really matters is your model species. So if we're gonna say do a, a you know, a what are they called, marmoset model, I think we would have to do PK to marmoset. Because you need to know in that, partic that particular model that it's getting into the brain with that unique biology of that species. So that's why we're mostly focused on mouse because most of our, our initial experiments are done in mice. So you start to think about higher species, I, I, I don't even know if you're doing pig or dog, or uh, when you start getting into the more preclinical tox level, when you start thinking about uh, um, dosing humans, what's the dose you wanna go into in humans, that's when you start to think about PK and higher species to start to draw those, those parallels. I guess what I'm getting at is the rigor is for that with the molecule to, to optimize it, right? Yeah. And, and go back and forth in that. But you're doing that all in the mouse and then switching later to another yeah. species. I mean, it could be completely different. Yeah. Yeah, and so I can only, I mean, I can speak for what we do and we're, we're really interested in getting to that in vivo proof of concept in an animal model. And typically we're using some kind of rodent, at least to date. And so that's where, you know, we're not using our resources to worry about whether we're still gonna get humans, because what it does, it validates the, the target and it validates the mechanism. 
And then if we can license it to, another, to a company like Biogen or whatever, they're the ones who can then worry about um, the higher, higher species PK sort of thing. And I don't know where they would take that into. I'm not sure if anybody else has any input. You know, where does Pfizer do, think about that? Something that I will add to that is because there's a, a cost, of course. There's a number of molecules, maybe you know, tens or hundreds of molecules that would go into PK studies. So the cheapest way to measure brain penetration, for instance, in an animal model would be to start with the mouse uh, mm -hmm. and eventually go into the rat and go into the higher models later. Um, for a typical uh, PK studies that we do, we uh, get both plasma concentration, brain, and CSF concentration at different time points and potentially at different doses. So for every dose, you use at least, you know, more than 20 animals. So that's not something that you could do in a macaque, for instance, uh, or even um, in dogs. That you would do that much later. Absolutely. So there, there's predictions that can be done uh, and correlations that can be done between the animal models that you're using and uh, the human dose that you would use in a clinical trial. So that's something that can be calculated. But ultimately, it's also empirical. Once you're in human, is it going to work at that dose? Um, you need to make sure to go high enough to see an effect. Uh, okay, so I'm going to now transition to a little bit to uh, a couple of slides on psychiatric disease drug discovery um, and what makes it uniquely hard here beyond even just the um, blood-brain barrier. So some of these slides I kind of stole from you, Steve, so that's okay. Um, so we know why schizophrenia is important. Um, it's highly prevalent and it's poorly treated by medications and the medications that are um, poorly treated except for the psychotic symptoms, and even then they're not, it's not 100% treated, and they are marked by significant side effects that are, still aren't well understood. So we need new therapies, um, and a lot of this is because the um, drugs that are currently on the market were discovered by serendipity. So these are not mechanism-based drugs, it's just they happen to work in some animal or some human as a side effect, and they're like, okay, let's put in schizophrenics, and then it happens to work. Um, and so there's been no advances in the field for decades, and this is made based upon the 12 or what is it, 2.6 billion dollars to get drugs to market. This has made drug companies really risk adverse in this space. And so why this is again a variation of one of Steve's slides. So why is it why is this so hard? Um, in part because we can't access the brain, so we can't do um, biopsies on them. We can't study the tissue like you could say a tumor or diseased liver or something like that. It's an incredibly complex organ. But for more practically speaking, we can't model psychiatric disease in rodents or in other models that are typically used in drug discovery field and other um, indication areas because mice just don't get schizophrenia. They can, they can have tumors and they can have liver disease, but they don't get schizophrenia. Or at least we don't, it's hard to tell if they can. But, um, and uh, because of this, basically, there's been no, um, you know, drug discovery has not been based on real hypotheses as to what's wrong. It's just been repeating what's out there. Those drugs do one thing, and so let's make more that do the same thing. And it's just a follow-on type atmosphere where everybody's end up with essentially this variations of the same drug. Um, another aspect, too, is the assays haven't been performed in human, human systems. They've been all been done in rodents other types of um, non-human species. And so all these kind of come together to make this field a uh, really difficult place to be. But the Stanley Center was founded to fix this problem, right? To really uncover the basic genetics of disease, um, to, to start to learn what's causing disease. Once you can do that, you can then start to think about how to leverage the information to figure out how to then cure the disease. So what we're focusing on are new mechanisms of action-based therapeutics. So everybody's familiar with this. I mean, the reason why we're interested in the genetics of schizophrenia is because it's highly heritable. And the genes actually point to causality. So it actually, instead of all the correlation studies, it's actually something that, that plays a role in causing disease. Um, and so we now have some biological insights which are new, um, which are really give insight into the basic pathogenesis of what's causing the disease. And if we know what causes the disease, we can think about 
um, using that information to find drug targets that then impact those disease mechanisms. And again, um, <coughs> the genetic studies have point to, uh, you know, this is a GWAS paper from 2014. Uh, they point, potentially points to targets. So this guy here is a dopamine receptor, or it's in the vicinity of the dopamine receptor. I don't want to say it's actually a dopamine um, GWAS hit. Um, but this is the target for the antipsychotics, right? So it suggests that this, this genetics may be pointing to uh, drug targets uh, at, at best, but it, you know, the other thing that's happening is a whole bunch of research around the impact of these, these genes and other um, genes coming from other studies that can point to um, disease pathways that we can, disease mechanisms that we can then think about targeting with a therapeutic. In addition, there's a whole host of work happening in terms of human neurons. Um, and so with all these different derivation techniques, you can come up with different types of cell types uh, from microglia, astrocytes, different types of neurons. And uh, these whole promise, as I'll show you in a couple slides, for potentially screening directly in, in human disease relevant cell types. Um, so we think the combination of these two things uh, could transform a drug discovery for psychiatric disease. So I'm going to talk about um, one project here about how we're using um, human neurons to uh, target a, um, a, a drug target that's implicated in schizophrenia and other psychiatric diseases that's been challenging to address um, for, for some technical reasons that I'll get into. And this is a collaborative project between Eugene and Kevin's lab and Yanling and, and my group. And so it's, it's based upon this idea of the uh, L-type calcium channel. So CACTA1C is an L-type calcium channel. There's a GWAS signal here in schizophrenia right in the middle of the gene. So it implicates this gene. It doesn't prove its causality, but it implicates this gene may play a role in schizophrenia. Uh, and it's also been linked with a number of other psychiatric diseases. One of the keys is bipolar, but also some, some syndromic diseases, um, some forms of autism. Um, and so it's a quite interesting target for schizophrenia, and it makes this protein a calcium channel called CAV1.3. Uh, so the question is, and CAV1.3 is a uh, calcium channel from the L-type calcium channel family. So the question is, can these L-type calcium channels such as CAV3.3 be a good target for psychiatric disease drug discovery, which makes sense because like dopamine receptor or something, it's a druggable target, which is in uh, GWAS locus, so maybe we should just target this directly with a therapeutic. So uh, what does this channel do? So it, it's, again, it's a calcium channel, it lets calcium in, and it, you know, voltage, uh, the membrane depolarizes, it lets calcium come in. Um, and calcium is a critical second messenger in cells. And uh, it sits at the postsynaptic site of synapses where it's thought to play a role in uh, activity-dependent gene transcription. So when activity happens, it depolarizes the membrane, calcium comes in and activates these transcription factors which go to the nucleus and then express the, um, or stimulate the expression of uh, immediate early genes, which then trigger the, the pathways of synaptic plasticity, long-term structural plasticity. And again, it's druggable, so it's a channel. So the channels are highly druggable, so you can make them more or less active. Um, so that's, this is all, it's all good, right? So it's in our disease, uh, synaptic, it's in the synapses, so it's a potentially interesting disease mechanism, it's druggable, it's a GWAS hit, so what's, what's, what's wrong? Well, the problem with something like L-type calcium channels is here, let's go back to uh, one of the earlier slides, is on-target side effects. Because these channels are highly expressed in blood vessels and the heart. And this guy here, nifedipine, which is one of the tool molecules we use to block this channel, is actually a marketed drug for blood pressure. So if you target L-type calcium channels in the brain, you might cause all sorts of side effects. So pharma companies have been very interested in this channel for all the reasons that I mentioned, but they're, most of them aren't actively working on this for, for these reasons, because it's just challenging, and so they'd rather pick an easier target. So uh, one of the things that, um, this is work, you know, working with um, Yan Ling and Eugene, the question is how to solve some of this, or solve this, this um, on target issue. And the question here is can you get some sort of brain selective modulator, something that only works in neurons? And so you can think about several ways that that can happen. For example, there could be some brain-specific specific splice isoforms. So maybe you can hit a specific part of the protein, which is only in uh, neurons. Uh, maybe there are accessory subunits. 
that uh, can modulate its function, and you can hit those. And maybe there's other ways, that are more brain-specific ways to modulate its activity through second messenger cascades. So L-type calcium channels, there's a whole host of different uh, splice isoforms. Um, I think there's something like 46 different reported splice isoforms. And some of them are brain-specific. Um, but there's, even within the brain, there's many different splice isoforms. And different regions have different brain or different splice isoforms. So then the question is, do we know which is the correct disease-relevant brain area? What's the disease-relevant splice isoform? So it gets very complicated. So then there's this idea of accessory subunits. So this is a, this is not a um, L-type calcium channel. This is um, probably a, it's a PQ or um, yeah, probably PQ, PQ type calcium channel. So these have. Um, so all calcium channels have some accessory subunits. Uh, in this case, it has what's called an alpha-2 delta uh, accessory subunit, which sits in the external side of the membrane. And um, you can actually find drugs that modulate these accessory subunits. So in this case, the, alpha, the drug Neurontin, which is uh, gabapentin, uh, binds to the alpha-2 delta subunit of the calcium channel and regulates uh, release of neurotransmitter from the C-type pain fibers in the, in the spinal cord, so it reduces pain, so it's a pain medication by reducing synaptic transmission. So you can end up with um, brain-specific uh, splice or um, accessory subunits, which potentially your, your drug could uh, interact with in that way. You can get some selectivity. Or there might be some intracellular channels or uh, pathways that could impact the signaling. So it's known that L-type calcium channels are modulated by a whole uh, bunch of different intracellular signaling pathways, like PKA, phosphorylase, it didn't change its activity. So maybe there's some brain-specific or neuron-specific modulatory intracellular pathways, and can we then target those with a drug? So um, the what we could do is spend years and years trying to study all those and end up with a very specific assay against a specific splice isoform of a specific um, accessory subunit that we think might be interesting. Uh, that's one approach. But right now, we don't know enough to do that. But the point here is that stem cell-derived neurons may play, may be able to solve that problem. Because if we assume that they are a disease-relevant cell type, they're going to have all those. They're going to have the right splice isoforms in those cells and the right accessory subunits and intracellular pathways. And what's from a drug discovery screening perspective, as uh, stuff that you know, Eugene's developed um, with, some, and with his collaborators, is you can do this stuff at scale. So you can grow neurons like this at scale, so you can do high throughput screening on them. So this is what we did in collaboration. We uh, took human derived neurons, plated them in 384 well plates, showed that they grow normal type um, uh, you know, processes and every, all their other stuff. And so to develop an assay, this is what Yan Ling did. Um, so here, potassium will depolarize. If you add external potassium, it depolarizes the membrane, opens up the channel, lets calcium come in. And then you can measure calcium influx into those cells using a dye, an intracellular dye called fluofor, which goes into the cells. Once it's in the cells, it can bind to calcium. It binds calcium, it fluoresces. You can measure calcium influx to the channel using this recorder. And so when you put this kind of thing on a microscope, uh, the system in a microscope, when you add KCL, you can see this increase in fluorescence, which is blocked by known inhibitors of the channel and increased by known activators of the channel. And then the question is turning that into an assay, so we can measure this calcium flux on a high throughput plate reader. It's called what we call the uh, it's called a flipper. It looks like this here, and it can measure calcium uh, influx into these cells in all 384 wells in parallel. And what you do is you load the plate loaded with cells and into somewhere in here. What is this one? I don't know. I don't know where it is. Somewhere in here, the plate goes. And then the um, robotic head adds potassium chloride to the cells. It depolarizes the cells, and the calcium um, uh, rises. And you measure the fluorescence, and that's what you see here. So this is an individual. These are individual wells that are simulated different concentrations of potassium chloride. And then to run an assay, what you do is you grow the neurons in these plates 14 days, you load them, you do your buffer, you put in the buffer, you incubate them with, for a little while, and then you add the compounds, and then you add your potassium chloride. And so a plate would look something like this. This is an individual, these are individual wells again, and it shows where you add the compound, you see this little change in fluorescence, and then you depolarize with KCL, and you see this increase in fluorescence, 
And this shows um, when you add the activator, it makes the response bigger, and blocker um, almost eliminates the response. And the whole plate will look something like this. You have positive controls on one end where they're all blocked, and these guys, I think, here are the positive controls where they're all activated. So this gives you the assay window, right? So these are the blocked and these are activated. And so what we find is that these cells actually respond quite well to uh, inhibitors and activators. So you see the nice concentration dependent decrease and increase in fluorescent with known blockers and activators. So this assay is performing very well and it has really good Z prime scores, like I mentioned before. So here we did a screen of about uh, 4,500 compounds from the Broad Repurposing Library, which is a library of compounds that have um, some annotation around them. A lot of them have some known targets. And uh, most of them have been um, through the clinic, uh, or at least got into the clinic at some point. So we screened them at two micromolar. And this, so this is a measure of the Z prime again. So this shows how well the assay worked. So Z prime of 0.6 is actually very good, especially for such a complex assay. So, so it shows that the assay is working, and we find hits. So we find things that make the response bigger and smaller. So these are, this is screened in duplicate. So it shows the two responses um, plotted against one another, the two replicates. So these guys bigger, it means it's activating it. And so we can find both activators and inhibitors in this screen. And so if you look at the breakdown based upon the annotation of these compounds, um, oops, blockers. So it confirmed they can identify blockers, known blockers. And then you can find other classes of compounds that actually do the same thing. And for activators, it's a little harder to activate. There are a couple of known ones. Here, it actually identified novel activators of the channel. Um, so and this, is, this is all, this is new, new pharmacology we discovered here. Um, so one of the things about this assay, so it goes back to the point I mentioned to Ollie, is that this is a phenotypic assay, right? So these are done in neurons. So there's a whole bunch of different, there's many different things that could lead to the activation of this readout not necessarily direct activation of the, of the calcium channel. So while we get to do a disease relevant cell type, the drawback is now we don't know exactly how this is actually functioning. And so some of the work that Yenling's done to try to characterize this guy, we're really interested in this, suggests that maybe it's not actually acting directly through the L-type calcium channel. It's another target that's making this, go, um, this signal go up. So this is some of the challenges that we deal with in terms of thinking about um, reductive systems versus more complex systems. Um, more complex systems are great in a lot of ways, but also have their, their side effects. But now that we, you know, if we're thinking about progressing something like this or doing a bigger screen of a much bigger library, you end up with some hits. One of the first things we want to do is look for selectivity. And so remember what I said before is um, uh, these are highly expressed in, in heart cells, right? So if you hit the heart, uh, CAV um, 1.3 would be a problem. So you could immediately think about screening, if you have a set of hits, screening those in cardiomyocytes, for example, and seeing if you affect cardiac cells directly. If they don't affect cardiac cells, they affect neurons, then you might be on the right path towards something with some brain or neuron selectivity. And that's the kind of thing you think about progressing towards a, an L-type calcium channel modulator into drug discovery. And then that would start this process, right? So this is right at the beginning of right here. And then 15 years from now, we might have an L-type calcium channel drug after one point or $2.6 billion. Um, so then also and that points to how you really need to set up these projects right in the first place if you're gonna invest nearly $3 million in them in the end. So that's it. So um, in an hour, we got through a crash course drug discovery and how uh, this it's more difficult in psychiatric disease, at least touched on that, and then how we have a nice collaborative project with Eugene and Kevin's group to you know, address some of those challenges at the early stage aspects of psychiatric disease uh, drug discovery. So if anybody has any other questions, I'd be happy to take some more. Yeah, why don't you? you want the, the question. Related to the question earlier, um, do you know whether you need to increase or decrease channel activity for schizophrenia? For the L-type? For, yeah, for 1.2. Yeah, we don't know. <laughs> right, so I mean, I guess my question is, is that going to be a priority before more is done, or, yeah? Yeah, um, yes. <laughs> so the, these, are, these, are, these are hard questions. So the, the thing is, um, 
but it's very obvious, I mean, it's an important question that we deal, we grapple with on a daily basis. So one of the things we think about is we don't really know for schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is really hard, but you could think about developing compounds for something that's sort of intermediate, right? So you can think about like Timothy syndrome or some forms of autism which have more penetrant um, alteration of function which you know what the direction is. And then you can start down the path of, of identifying tool compounds or um, that might be useful for something like that. And then you can use those tool compounds and then continue to probe the biology to see you know, what the right direction would be in terms of something like schizophrenia, which is much more difficult to think about how you want to modulate the activity. But looking at things like rare variants are a lot easier. So the stuff coming out of schema actually is a lot, gives us a much better handle as to what direction we want to take things in. That's why for a lot of this, um, a lot of what we're thinking um, is really, well, we're really excited about the rare variants and what that uh, analysis can, can do because it tells you the directionality, you know exactly what you need to do with the therapeutic. That's so I, I think what you're saying though points to the need to address directionality and even fine mapping for yeah. you're gonna pursue common variants. And of course, at the SAB, um, and even with a hint a year ago, uh, Kevin and Steve McCarroll used their villages to find EQTLs. <laughs> now we gotta be careful, that gives you a directionality of expression, doesn't directly say that the channel is, ac is activated or deactivated, right. and, and it could be that what you're really doing is by decreasing expression a little bit, you're changing the stoichiometry of, it, of how the channels are put together. They could have very complicated physiological effects. Nonetheless, I think what you're pointing at is maybe as the therapeutics team gets more interested in a particular potential target, um, there should be a feedback process right. for us to do more fine mapping and determination of directionality. I mean, uh, and, and I, I feel strongly about this because psychiatrists have been giving bipolar patients L-type calcium channel blockers for years to treat uh, symptoms of bipolar disorder. There's never been a convincing clinical trial because this is all off-label use right. and no drug company has ever wanted to do a trial. And the results in clinical practice are empirical and equivocal and it could be that they're doing exactly the opposite of what should be done, right? So yeah. Um, yeah, or it's could hard, but yeah. it seems really important to, for us as a, as a group to support your efforts and figure out these, uh, the directionality when, when there's an opportunity to do that. Yeah, for the common variance for sure, yeah. And that's it's definitely a challenging thing that we're, we're grappling with. Right. Um, but it's important that we get to the bottom of it. Yeah. But in the meantime, I think the rare variants give us yeah, an yeah, easier I mean, thing just, to, to tackle. The other strategy so. is just to keep flogging TJ to give you more results. <laughs> well, we'd let Ed do yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> do we have any other questions? So you mentioned something about the um, brain-specific isoforms in certain target. So how do you identify those uh, isoforms? protein or mRNA or things like that? Uh, those are typically done through RNA, through R some sort of RNA-seq, my understanding is anyway. Um, yeah, at least in that, that one study. I don't, um, for the L-type calcium channel, it's done through RNA analysis. All right, thank you, Jeff. <laughs>